you're, you know, as you're writing something on the board, if you're in first and third grade, or, you know, as you're doing your morning meeting, you can regard your preschool to be, you know, talking about what you're doing um, is, is a wonderful modeling technique and important, you know, for learning. Um, another question, uh, when we do out, you know, we say it's really important that physical development, but do you think that you can tie academics into outdoor play? And can you use outdoor play constructively and not just as a, you know, not just as an outlet? Do you think sometimes we take full advantage of outdoor play, I guess is where I'm going to. And what are some ways that we can take more advantage of outdoor play? That's probably one of the hardest things I think to plan is your physical activity. Even at the preschool level, like really plan physical activity. So, um, you know, you ha have you seen anything that you felt has been really well done as physical activities that really has helped children gain learning? Even like in the ABC, we do like the therapeutic activities outside. Okay. So like, I mean, just having group activities that don't take up the whole time, but kind of is like a transition between um, you know the free time that they have, or like when they need to calm down more and have like a group activity. Okay, and all of this ties into the developmentally appropriate and also individualizing. Shauna brought up the good point of we have to watch: is it too much time or too little time that we spend on something? So sometimes we can, you know, spend too much time on an activity. You know, sometimes a five-minute learning activity stays longer with the child than a 15-minute learning activity, depending upon the age. Um, when you're out in those fields, and we talked a little bit too, that, and, and I know, and I'm at fault of, with this. I try not to do it in here, but in general, so go on and sleep on me. But um, in the EEC, we don't sometimes give children enough time to process their thoughts um, because they do need longer than most of us need as adults. And they may still be processing the beginning of your question where you're like, come on, answer me. You know, answer me. I have one little boy right now who, I mean, he's, he's very stubborn. He's very, like, I'm just not going to answer your question. You ask anything, I won't answer it. So I just wait and wait for him. I'm like, well, you know, it's going to be really sad because you're going to go, we're going to go to snack and you, I just need you to tell me one thing. And he's starting to. You know, he's starting to at least start to respond to those questions about what you do this weekend. I mean, he'll just sit there and look at you. Or he won't look at you. He'll just like go all over the place like this. So, you know, again, just giving that child. And, and then not backing yourself into a corner. And if that's my one piece of advice to you as a teacher, I mean, after you back yourself into a corner a couple times, you really like get cautious about backing yourself in the corner because be careful what you say. You know, if you do not do this, you are not going to go outside. Are you really going to carry that through? You know, is that really a valid? Do you really want to do that to the child? You know, is my question. No, I, that's why I, I don't do. But you know, if when you say, you know, if you do not do this, you are not going to have something to do. Now, are you really going to carry that through? So, uh, once you back yourself into a corner as a teacher, then you know, then you're you're there trying to figure out, okay, now how do I get myself and the child out of this situation? But another question I had is, when you go out to those fields, do you see best practices going on in classrooms? What, whatever age level classroom it is. Are you observing what you would call best practice, that thinking about environment, um, looking at how to teach and enhance? Um, are you, are they, are teachers thinking about what children, you know, are the children gaining from the lesson that they're presenting? So what kind of best practices are you seeing out there? Are there any best practices that you have to share? Anything? That's something that I want you to think about, though.
what does best practice mean to you? Now, and how are you going to bring best practice into your room? And uh, again, the standard for early childhood is Macy. And they have, you know, the principles of um, looking at development, looking at involving the families. Andrew brought up the six points um, that are very important to designing that learning and using learning for the best of your, you know, using your activity for the best learning. And another thing uh, that we're always thinking about is how do we meet all styles of learning? Do you, are you being sure to incorporate activities that are meeting all styles of learning? And I think that was some of the questions that I had for you. So um, I want to, I'm going to look, and if I go through something really fast and, and you want to talk about it a little bit more, please let me know. Um, you know, I really just want to look a little bit at this development appropriate because what I want to do is go over to the CEC and we're going to do some things with development appropriate practice. Lapses. And 
other children don't want to be the only person that places with her. So it's really a struggle trying to get, you know, a child like that to realize that you can play with somebody one day, and if they don't want to play with you the next day, it doesn't mean they don't like you. It doesn't mean that they're not your friend. So that came up in the discussion too. How do you help children to learn to be friends with everybody, but also form, all of us form, close friendships? You know, we're not meant to be a close friend with everybody that's in the class. So, um, so interpersonal and interpersonal, you know, some of us are definitely more introverted, some of us are a little bit more extroverted, and, and we need um, the introverts to need a little bit more support socializing in a classroom setting. What are some of those techniques that you can use? Um, I think Anna has some really good ones from the book that the chapter that she read that you know you can do some different things, not all the time. <coughs> children in a different way, you can put them into centers that they don't instinctively go into, um, you can mix children who are at different ability levels so that they are interacting with each other so that there, you know, there are different ways that you can encourage all the children working together. So when you look at responsive education for all learners, you know, you are differentiating instruction. And, and the environment, I heard some of you say that too. I think the more you teach, the more you realize how important the classroom environment is. And, um, and it's okay, you know, the first year you teach. If the second year you think, oh, I really want to do this differently. Um, or if you change things, at, you know, you see something that works, you see something in another classroom. Um, you begin to realize that you are teaching in your environment a lot. And we're going to talk about that when we talk about the environmental range of scale and effort. So just adapting your processes and assessing your product. You, know, you might try a learning activity or a learning product that you think is going to be outstanding and really produce the results that you want, and then you try it and you realize, you know, well, this really didn't work well with children. So I need to look for something else for science. Um, have you seen the response to intervention system being used in any, I mean, I'm pretty sure Grove City uses it in some of their classes, the, uh, the RTI. Has any of you seen this system being used? Yeah, this has become very popular in a lot of, um, a lot of school districts, especially in the primary grade. There is actually a preschool version of it now, too. It is research-based curriculum, and it's collaborative, so it involves your teachers, your administrators, um, that you are screening for those learning difficulties, you're focusing on the instruction that's being provided, and it's that ongoing process. Um, you brought that up in almost every discussion I heard about observing, observing, observing as an, an assessment. So RTI really stresses um, the observation and then intensive instructional intervention. So it's really um, come from the special education aspect, but it has a much more relationship-oriented and interactive component to it. Uh, I know Grove City has had some real success with the RTI system because they can really focus on that learner at the primary grade, and, and especially with reading and math, because there are things that children are struggling with that they become stronger before they move up into the upper level. And um, this is the recognition and response system, the R&R, &R, that is related to that, again, screening and monitoring learning and letting your families know that screenings do not mean that there's something wrong with their child. Screenings are meant, um, and hopefully we're going to um, get to see some hands-on, not the screenings being done, but a facility where screenings are done and some of that early intervention. Um, because the screenings really help those children to move into the, to the screening process, and then having the intervention help them move to that level of development that they need to be at. So it's, you know, the cognitive, it could be speech, it could be OT, it could be teaching. But it's really collaborative problem solving method. And it's a great and important way to let parents see that they are teachers of their children, that they have a lot to offer. And even if they're so happy. 
out and having um, therapies done, that what they do at home to build on those therapies is equally as important. And that's really the same for an adult who's getting OT or PT. As any of you have ever had OT or PT or speech therapy or you know had any type of uh, an intervention like that, you know that you can't just go and do that therapy at the facility. There are exercises, there are things you have to do at home. And this is a really important way to involve the family that they are collaborating. They're helping their child move to the developmental level that the child seems to be at. So these are just some of the things that we talk about in early childhood special education. But um, I'm going to say to you again, when you think about early childhood, what are some of the things that you think about? What kind of facilities do you think about as early childhood facilities? You want to go play and you can just do another talk. Go ahead now. Um, I mean, often what my kids Other than that, the ones I'm doing Okay, what age level? And I'm not just talking, I know I have this up, but I'm not talking about just special education early childhood. When you think of early childhood, what are some of the many different types of facilities that you think about? Preschool, okay. Shelby? I was going to say preschool. Okay, anything else? Child care, daycare, they don't like to be called daycare anymore. <laughs> No, I know. That's an, an out again. Here's that past ten years where early childhood says we are professionals. We want to up our professional status. Really child care now? No, it's child care because um, I mean, I to me daycare doesn't have a bad connotation, but I someone I must have been Laura. I was talking to you about that today. Child cares were not always considered educational. So that daycare setting, it was like, okay, you brought your child and they didn't do anything all day. You were just taking care of them for the day. But child care and the connotation of early childhood is more that you are caring for the child. You are helping their whole development. So they use the new term in child care, just like we don't like to be called a daycare or child care over here we like to call it education center. So it's just all in that term. That's been the past 10 years of just trying to up that professionalism of early childhood. Just don't forget any some really important points. Yeah. Yeah. Why are you doing this? Yeah. 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 What about time and resources? Early childhood is not just preschool. It is not just child care. It is kindergarten, first and second grade. And you are going to be preparing lessons for kindergarten first because we won't go to second grade just because um, of our time frame. But what you do in kindergarten and first grade and preschool can be done in second and third grade also. So when you think of early childhood, you should be thinking from birth to age eight. And early intervention, special education is part of that. Um, and child care, the, the professionalism of child care, preschool, schools, like the public schools have always had those state standards, their departments of education. Um, what happened in Pennsylvania is that there was a department of welfare and there was a department of education. The department of welfare did not have the same professional status or recognition that the department of education had. Whether that was wrong or right, but again, that's because child cares were not expected to be following learning standards, daycare. They were not expected, to, the child could just go there all day and play with whatever they wanted in some centers. They weren't all like that. Please don't get me wrong. But what happened in Pennsylvania to bring that professionalism up was that the Department of Welfare and the Department of Education merged and became the office, OCDEL, the Office of Child Development and Early Learning is, is OCDEL. And that now oversees all the child care facilities, all the educational settings. Um, we are under that through the Pennsylvania Department of, that's the Pennsylvania Department.
of the vegetation because of being part of the vegetation part. So Oxel is the one who updates the standards, the pre-K standards. Oxel has been involved in the poor, poor body of knowledge. So there, there became um, a connection between the Department of Welfare and the Department of Education, and the standards became more aligned. So that's why parents started schools, especially in urban areas. Keystone stars means that you have to be rated as a child care setting. So uh, do any of you work in child care over the summers? Or okay, do you know about Keystone in Pennsylvania or about the Keystone? Yeah. Okay, in Pennsylvania, Keystone, Florida, and Pennsylvania. So uh, you know, they if you want, especially in an urban area. If families to come, you are going to want to be a Keystone 3 or a Keystone 4. There's Keystone, there's Stars 1, Stars 2, Stars 3, and Stars 4. And the higher your star rating, the better quality your environment is, your learning activities, um, your attention to early intervention, and having children screen for things. Um, and in order to get a NACI accreditation, you have to be a Keystone Star 4. You can't even go after NACI accreditation without being a star four, because that just looks at your whole overall program. So over the past 10 years, and over the past, the, just the past five years, the standards for early childhood. Now, do school districts follow those same standards? They are still under the Department of Education. But um, can they become NACI accredited? They go after things like the um, Blue Ribbon School. other states have that award where you, know, you, are, you are a nationally recognized school. So um, I, all of you I'm sure have heard of educational spike and any of the special education courses. Um, Children with disabilities are just as diverse as children who are normally developing. You know, our diversity doesn't just have to do with our disability. We all have some disability in some way. Um, and a lot of disorders, you know, don't occur just um, in isolation. I mean, you know, there are things that social disorders, uh, sometimes that diagnosis, there aren't just specific educational interventions. It, it depends upon the child. Some interventions work for one child and do not work for another child. Or in poultry, the case is for a group that is a, is a center time pediatric, which has now become a, a very uh, large presence in our community looking at some of these educational interventions and interventions for children, young children up to the age of eight with special needs. And they are doing an excellent job of speech therapy, sensory um, integration, sen sensory issues, um, PT and OT. And then uh, you're very familiar with the individual uh, with disabilities education act. Um, and the federal funding can't go to the parents. It goes directly to the parents not to the agencies that are involved. And children with, with all of all abilities are eligible for free and appropriate public education. Many times as parents before with children with special needs didn't feel that they were welcome into public schools or didn't feel that their child was going to fit in. Parents are becoming much bigger advocates for their children with special needs. They want them to accomplish as much as any other normally as much as they are capable of accomplishing. And so they really, I mean, they check into those guidelines and they find out what um, a need for the child. And up to the age of three, we have the Individual Family Service Plan, the IFSP. After the age of three, it's an IEP. And it's really, again, a collaborative team effort. It includes families, it has all the therapists that the children are involved with, it has the regular classroom teacher, the special education teacher, um, and if you're in special ed or in special ed, you will be doing a lot of paperwork with IEPs and IFSPs. 
the difference um, with the IFSC is typically there are a lot more multiple agencies involved, so there's one service coordinator who is assigned so that they can kind of monitor all that and they keep that focus on that natural learning environment. Could be grandma's house, could be home, it could be child care. It depends upon where the child spends the majority of their of their hours. So, um, the nat as I said, the natural learning environment is just so where are their main everyday routines and activities spent. So, um, I'll, I'll continue to say over and over again, don't forget what early childhood is. It encompasses way more than just preschool. Um, and I know that for you, that's where your main exposure comes. And that's why once you get out and see the kindergarten and the first grade and higher, in a different way, not just from a field experience, but from that aspect of early childhood. So some of the effects of practices for children with diverse abilities. Um, in every, in the group, if you think about the group that you were in tonight and your discussions, you talked about all of these things, working as a team, assessing, assessing, needs and progress. Um, okay, what's the need? How do we achieve it? How do we make progress on it? What do we need? What's the next step? What do we need to do now? Routine-based assessment, um, planning individual instructional strategies, identifying goals, creating learning opportunities, um, using helpful strategies, and reinforcing constantly children's learning. That reinforcement, again, is so important for children who are struggling with learning, and especially children to the age of eight. The more it's reinforced, the more they remember. You know how we say with your lessons, do that anticipatory set. Carry that into your learning. Your clothes should carry back to your anticipatory set because the more you reinforce that, that concept, and doing one or two concepts as early childhood is enough for the children and, and retain. So you want to monitor that progress through observing. So what I'd like to do now is um, we are going to look at the environment in the Early Education Center, but not tonight. And we're going to look at it in a different aspect from your field experience that you have there or are having. But what I've done is I've set up some activities over in the Early Education Center. So in a few minutes move over there. You're going to need to do a couple things. You're going to work in about groups of two. You're going to look at the pre-K standards that are bookmarked. And you're also going to need to look at the core body of knowledge. So when we go over, we'll go over to the set. And I'll show you what some of the activities are. The first thing I want you to look at is the pre-K standards. So you pick up your activity, you're going to explore it with your partner, and you're going to decide, okay, which area of the standards does this um, most apply to? Where could I use it? Would it help me develop social skills in children? Is this a physical activity? Would I be developing language, science, math? And talk about how you might use it in a pre-K setting. Then I want you to talk about, all right, can I take this activity and effectively use it at kindergarten and or first grade? And after you've chosen the pre-K standard that you think most applies to that activity and come up with a simple way you might use it in class, and I want you to look at the core body of knowledge for your kindergarten and first grade. Is there a related standard? Could you take that same activity and scaffold it and advance it and use it at kindergarten or first grade? And how would you do that? Um, now, we're not going to have a chance for it. We're working groups of two. We're not going to have a chance for you to try all the different activities. But give you a little bit of time to develop that activity at pre-K, kindergarten, and or first grade. And then you're going to you know, show your peers and talk to them about it. Like, okay, so here's the standard. I think that this activity could best be used to develop a science concept. And 
and here's the standard. Now, the new pre-K standards, and I'm going to tell you this honestly, um, they really, some of them are much more strict to eight-year-old oriented. Okay? So because they really want to do those things with core body and knowledge. So what we are doing right now is even just find a main category. Like if you if you think it's science and you look at curiosity and imagination and science, you don't have to go down and pick out a specific standard. You can use the main categories of the standard. And then also look at the core body of knowledge and the main categories. Um, so what I want you to see is that ability to what you see as only pre-K over here it tends to be used at kindergarten or first grade level. Now I'm not saying all the activities can. I I think that you will find that most of them can be. And then how do the standards carry into the core body of knowledge are the two things that you're looking at. Do you see a connection? Have they aligned them well? Do you see the standards aligned with the core body of knowledge and that capability of developing those skills? Does that make sense? So um, I really want you to look at the activity and kind of play with it a little bit. Uh, you can take your things over if you want. You will need your computer so that you can look up the pre-K standards and the core body of knowledge. If you want to leave your other things here, that's up to you. And you can come back to us when we finish over there, and then we'll be, we'll be done for the evening, okay? So um, uh, 